Okay. So, yeah, I guess I'm going to take the meeting minutes and uh, manage the queue. Uh, Brian, you are going to share, as uh, you guys are all aware of. Um, this is just a continuation of our conference call series uh, because of the cancelled uh, March IDF meeting. And uh, based on request, we are going to talk about Depop again. And um, you may have also seen the announcement about the upcoming IDF meeting, which will also be online. So we'll uh, have to run another Google ball to figure out what suitable conference call meeting slots yeah, and yeah, um, do that for the next few months as well. Tony, uh, since you joined, I don't know if you have a chance to also help me with the meeting minutes. Or anyone, actually. Um, I put the, the link into the chat window. Okay, perfect. And um, I will hand over to you, Brian. Okay. Um, I assume, uh, I don't know, you don't need to do a note well or anything. <laughs> I yes. just assume we're all noted well. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, the rules are the same for um, the other conference calls we had. Uh, so the IDF note well applies. I'm not going to, um, Share any uh, working group yes, slides okay. because there is only one topic uh, today, as as you all, as everyone knows, uh, posted it to the list. So, I guess you are not by accident in this conference call. No, I was just uh, I didn't know if we were needed to do anything formal to make sure. I don't I don't know. Silly of me to think. As formal as you can get here. Now. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, it's always a little uncertain on this side of things. Are Slides showing up for folks. Yep, works. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, back at it with uh, Depop. We're going to try this again because uh, we ran a little short on time uh, the last time we went through it. Um, I'm going to give a bit of an overview again, try to level set where where things are in terms of the document and how the interaction and protocol works right now uh, and then discuss a quick status update of kind of how we got to where we are with the document and then roll through some uh, open issues of sorts or open questions and see if we can um, get some input feedback and maybe even get to some consensus on where to where to take those things in the next revision of the document. So with uh, that in mind, here we go. So uh, what is Depop? Basically, we're talking about an application level proof of possession for uh, access and refresh tokens in OAuth. And uh, the little diagram at the bottom here shows a uh, normal OAuth flow where you have your token request and you get your access token and you use your access token to access a protected resource. Um, the key change here is that this thing called a Depop proof flows both on the access token request as well as the um, the uh, protected resource request and in turn the uh, the proof itself is uh, JWT that's sent as an HTTP header and this demonstrates um, a reasonable level of proof of possession in the context of the particular HTTP request. It's sent the same way and with the same syntax and semantics for both the token request to the authorization server as well as for the protected resource request. Um, it's a job, a look at the details in the next slide, but basically the, the AS can use that proof to bind tokens to the public key included in the uh, DPOP proof and in turn the RS can use the proof to verify the, the binding in bound tokens that it receives on protected resource requests. That DPOP proof is, again, it's sent as an HTTP header, um, but it itself is a JWT, and here's a look at sort of the, uh, the exploded semantics of it. It's explicitly typed, because uh, that's what we're doing these days. We're some supporting asymmetric algorithms um, only for signature algorithms. And then in the header is the public key as a JWK member 
the public key for which proof of possession is more or less being demonstrated. So the key is included in line in the header, basically saying this is the key that was used to sign this token. And then in the body, there's a JTI, a unique identifier that uh, right now is being used for replay checking. Uh, and then there's a minimal amount of information about the HTTP request, basically the method and the URL or URI of the request omitting any query or fragment portions. Um, and then there's a timestamp that uh, is there of the issuance of the proof and the server side, either authorization server or resource server, um, is free to accept proofs for some minimal limited time window relative to the creation time. So there's not an explicit expiry, but an expectation and requirement that the issuance time be used and only, um, only accept these as valid for some minimal period of time uh, around the issuance time. And uh, it is uh, potentially extensible, but this is what is specified in the main uh, content of the proof itself. So then uh, that proof is sent as an HTTP header in, uh, with the name DPOP and in an access token request. Here's an example there of you see the, the proof JWT in the header and then the normal stuff you'd normally expect in an access token request. This is an authorization code request. And that allows um, the authorization server to verify that this client holds possession of the private key corresponding to the public key that's in this DPOP proof and can in turn bind the access token that it issues to that public key. And um, the access token here is an encoded JOT and you see the token type here is DPOP used to differentiate that this access token type itself or this access token itself is bound to the DPOP public key. Um, this could be the same thing with a uh, reference style access token. This is the exact same response, just with a shorter access token here to demonstrate that it's not specifically um, required to be a jot. It could be either a reference style or opaque. And ultimately to the, to the client, it's opaque. But here we can deal with any kind of token. But the token type um, still indicates DPOP to indicate to the client that this is in fact a DPOP bound access token. For uh, JWT and introspected access tokens, we do, uh, in the sake of sort of interoperability and commonality, we define the confirmation method that carries this confirmation method claim that carries the SHA-256 JWK thumbprint hash of the DPOP public key to which the access token is bound. So when using JOTS as access tokens, uh, the confirmation claim indicates the binding to the public key through a hash of the um, JWK thumbprint. And then the same, um, same information is conveyed in the form of an introspection response um, to indicate the binding. Of course, if the AS and RS are conveying information about the content of the token in some other format, um, database lookup, whatever, certainly they're not required to use this format, but this is provided for the sake of interoperability around JOT style access tokens and access tokens, which are introspected. A protected resource request, uh, once the client has obtained a DPOP bound access token, it sends it in the authorization header um, with a DPOP scheme. This is the job from the, the previous example a few slides ago, and also sends in turn uh, a DPOP proof and doing the same um, same syntax, semantics, and header name as it normally would to send that proof in the header. And this, then you have the access token, which is bound to the public key, and proof that possession of the corresponding private key is provided in the EPOP header here. This is just showing that this could, of course, be a protected resource request with a smaller reference style access token. It doesn't have to be a job. Presumably, then this would be introspective to figure out the details and the binding, but the proof is sent the same way. And the proof again provides uh, proof of possession of the public key and, or the private key corresponding to the public key to which that access token has been bound. So that's a quick uh, overview of how that thing works, some current, uh, current recent status and updates and so forth. So um, uh, beginning of April, we um, moved this draft to a working group draft. 
leading up to the last interim uh, about the document, uh, tried to push out a, a one revision, a lot of editorial updates, some uh, key things that were done. We more formally defined the DPOP authorization header scheme, so it's in line with the expectations for what actually is needed to be done to define uh, an authorization um, request or uh, authorization header. And that included also defining the www authenticate challenge for that same scheme. And worth noting here is that challenge can include uh, an Alex parameter, which is a way for the resource server to indicate the supported signing algorithms that it supports for the JWT, or uh, sorry, for the DPOP proof JWTs. Um, there's not a similar uh, challenge response mechanism necessarily uh, enabled um, for the authorization server because things are happening in a little bit different layer. So we added a D DPOP signing out value supported authorization server metadata value. So this uh, gives the same information, but for the authorization server and in the authorization server metadata lookup to understand what signing algorithms are supported there. Uh, a few little minor things added a, a error code for token or uh, errors from the authorization server in the token request. Did some stuff to IANA and moved a few things around. Um, during this time period, too, there was an IAW session that unfortunately I wasn't at, but got some um, feedback secondhand, uh, much of which was close to the list. Thanks, Mike, for doing this. Um, and we'll be trying to touch on some of the things that I understand came up um, during that session. So it sounds like it was useful. Um, this was uh, discussed, as many of you know, during an uh, interim session on May 5th, uh, but didn't get through a lot of the content just due to time constraints. And some feedback on this was received around the same time. So kind of a combination of those three different uh, items in the last. There's been some feedback, questions, and so forth that I'll try to um, at least get to or, or summarize the, the various open questions and see if we can um, I don't know, try to, try to push forward and get to a little bit more consensus about where we want to handle some of these things. Um, so one of the, uh, one of the early issues and, and questions we've had early on is what about the threat model and overall objectives of this document? Um, obviously, there is a lot of room for uh, uh, improvement and clarification in the, in the document itself. And honestly, I'm uh, hoping Dr. Fett here can help with writing and rewriting these parts of the document because he's much more versed in that kind of work than I am. But uh, just for the sake of this, this particular presentation, I borrowed some of this content um, from this publication that he shared with the list uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, that describes mostly the attacker model. Um, Daniel, feel free to jump in if I uh, misrepresent anything here or you want to add to it. But basically, you know, there's a couple of key attacks that, that uh, or, or models of the attacker that, that this would uh, outright mitigate. One would be a misconfigured resource endpoint, either through um, you know, social engineering or other kinds of mistakes. If an access token is sent to a resource server controlled uh, endpoint, that, uh, that endpoint could not in turn turn around and play it to the original, the, uh, um, the legitimate resource server for that because it couldn't uh, reproduce the proof with the, with the appropriate content. Um, similar in nature, but maybe coming about through different reasons, if a, a resource server was uh, intentionally malicious or possibly just compromised partially uh, you know, by some internal actor or something, this uh, DPOP would prevent the, uh, the replay of a uh, legitimate access token across from that compromised resource server to a legitimate resource server. Um, potential other things were like if a TLS termination is done um, within the same sort of trust boundaries as the resource server, but, but at different components, which is a fairly common deployment um, if that particular component were somehow compromised, um, it says here, for example, maybe by a, a buffer overflow or something in the reverse proxy itself that's doing TLS termination, um, that, again, could be prevented by uh, um, 
preventing that particular place from replaying the token from uh, from there to uh, uh, endpoint uh, resource server endpoint at which it was not uh, intent not intended to be used by the client itself. We have the sort of stolen token model. So obviously uh, a bound token cannot be used um, by an attacker who just gets the token itself without also showing possession of the, the private key. So um, a browser-based client with a, or with a JavaScript client, if tokens are exfiltrated themselves, um, they cannot be used uh, used by the attacker without corresponding access to the private key. So if tokens alone are exfiltrated, it prevents that kind of, it prevents the attacker from being reused. Um, one area that it doesn't prevent, and I guess the the question here really, and I'm, I'm not sure there is much of a question other than to say this particular type of attack is out of scope, where it's an on online cross site scripting attack, where rather than exfiltrating the tokens themselves, the attacker simply drives, I say simply, it's not simple, but it's certainly possible, drives the entire attack through the browser and JavaScript client. So the tokens aren't stolen and reused outside of the context of the browser, but are used, um, used directly within the context of the browser. And in turn, that provides access, presumably, to the, the corresponding signing key for the DPOP crew. Um, this is sort of a reductio ad certum kind of thing because pretty much any type of um, you know, security mitigation that has these, that, that's susceptible to an online um, XSS style attack uh, is, is itself like, it, there's not much that can be done to prevent this other than preventing the, the original vector itself of the cross-site script in the time. Um, sort of a, uh, I guess it's sort of a middle ground of those two would be trying to understand whether or not we need to prevent the idea of pre-computed proofs. So consider uh, the same kind of um, attack with cross-site scripting or per perhaps you know um, maliciously loaded javascript that could exfiltrate tokens and also exfiltrate pre-calculated proofs to be used later from uh, a third party and this is possible now um, conceptually anyway because the proof itself doesn't contain any particular server side generated um, or server-side provided proof of, uh, or not, I'm sorry, not proof, but, but nonce or um, other, other entropy. So it's possible that if you had access to the use of the private key without being able to actually steal the private key, but you could pre-compute -com, pre DPOP proofs that would be valid at particular resources and at a particular time later on in the future, and then exfiltrate that in conjunction with the bound token and use those independently later on. Um, although it's sort of, uh, yeah, uh, this is possible. Given, given it, if the, the vector is possible, then, then the nature of the proof would allow this to happen because there's not a server side generated component into the proof. Um, uh, just gonna catch up for a moment. The, there's also the possibility that um, you know exfiltration happens somewhere else outside uh, otherwise from the secure channel. One example here would be like the breach attack against HTTP compression. Um, if a token is is just stolen through sort of this or other types of means while not correspondingly getting access to use or or, or steal the the keys incorporated in it, obviously we can prevent. Um, prevent reuse of that token by itself because, because of the binding to the, the proof that wouldn't be able to be provided by the attacker in that case. Um, so that's my attempt at um, <laughs> wading through uh, Daniel's uh, attacker models. Um, moving on to uh, an issue that I, I sort of want to put out here because it's there, but maybe put it, put it behind us for the time being. 
And that is that symmetric cryptography is significantly um, orders of magnitude more efficient than asymmetric cryptography. And this has been raised as a potential problem for deployments with DPoC um, because we are using exclusively asymmetric cryptography, public private keys, and need to use them on every request. Um, and this is true, but there are other costs and complexities involved in, in um, getting to uh, symmetric keys. So, um, you know, there's trade offs involved. Right now, we've sort of settled in on the asymmetric model. And while it's true that it's, it's significantly slower, um, less efficient, uh, there's no argument around that. The actual real world implications of how it could be deployed and used haven't actually been quantified. So, uh, maybe it's a little bit of a kick the can down the road, but um, it's still usable and deployable. We don't know how difficult or at what point it becomes problematic. And so um, it, it's sort of a, a theoretical uh, objection at this point. There are a couple different potential approaches that we could take. Um, I list two of them here. There's probably many more, but if we were to look at trying to get to a symmetric type approach, and one would be the key distribution type model that we've, we've discussed for a long time, but has some drawbacks in particular that it, it is difficult to get the key distributed to the right parties without in turn undermining the value of uh, protect, preventing the, the RS to RS type replay situations. And then there's a key agreement model that um, Neil suggested looking at a while back that um, in some ways is uh, more complicated because it it requires a few steps to get to an agreement, but um, to agree on a key, but it allows for that key agreement to occur between the two parties involved and provides many of the same types of benefits as the asymmetric model that we're using now. Um, so I guess I, I would say if we, we do circle back and try to do something here, the key agreement model in my mind is a lot more appealing because it's, it provides more value, uh, but that's, that's me and it, sort of moot at this point because I'm considering this whole issue sort of closed, at least for now anyway, coming out of the meeting you had before uh, the, the what was to be one of IETF 107 in Vancouver that didn't happen we had a week or two before that. And basically the, the consensus through that meeting and the subsequent call for adoption was to move forward with the, the DPOP document more or less obviously as it's, it's currently defined. So we're gonna sort of forge forward with uh, with the asymmetric functionality for now and, um, and sort of put put this question behind us at least at least for the meantime until we can get some real uh, real implementation and deployment feedback and see if it is in fact really problematic uh, or or not at least for most deployments um, somewhat related but uh, also its own issue is that there's been um, questions and issues raised with the difficulty of the current or at least perceived current uh, nature of the JTI, the JWDT uh, identifier claim. And it's used now to allow a server to detect replay. So the idea is that the server would track uh, JTI values and um, reject requests when it sees a duplicate JTI. This can be very problematic, um, particularly for large scale deployments because it requires um, you know, state management across um, distributed nodes. And this in turn can also exacerbate inefficiencies around the asymmetric crypto problem. If um, you know, the, the signing can be inefficient, but the ability to just scale out nodes is, is certainly a possibility to just throw more compute powder at it to deal with the, the cost of the asymmetric crypto. But if you're being required to synchronize state to track the JTI values across all those nodes, you sort of undermine some of the improvements you get from that scaling out operation. Um, so the current situation we have this right now is, is um, we also have the issue that time, which also uh, allows for the, you know, limits the replay window, not specifically the replay of any particular uh, proof, but it certainly ratchets down the window and the possibility of any re replay be happening. We are not trying to replace TLS at all. Um, the proof flows from uh, the client to the server. And so the, the need um, in that 
context is a little bit unclear if there's really a, a true need to do sort of the, the one-time use prevention on any one particular proof. Um, and the current text in the document does say that the, the replay check and prevention on JTI, it's not a must, it's a should. And in places it's quantified with, excuse me, qualified with text like do this within a reasonable consideration of accuracy and resource utilization, that if you see the same JTI value that uh, reject it. Um, the idea being there that it leaves implementations with some room, wiggle room to do this checking to the extent that they feel is reasonable with respect to the rest of their architecture. So if you had large scale horizontally distributed nodes, perhaps you would only check um, and retain, you know, a JTI prevention cache locally on each node. So uh, it provides some level of protection, but not with the overhead cost of trying to synchronize state across those. Um, that was certainly the, the idea in writing that with the should and the, the qualifications was to allow for those kinds of decisions to be made without um, violating normative requirements of the protocol itself. So, um, I'm a little unsure where to go with this going forward. Um, we could do some things like ex explicitly mention that the space that you need to check for is qualified by the URI and method, which also reduces the scope of the data replication needed. Um, like if you're, you, you don't need to check the JTI value for different hosts or even different paths. So you don't necessarily have to replicate or manage it as wide as the current document might suggest. Um, we could further loosen or qualify the requirements I talked about before, like maybe moving it to a may or even, even uh, sort of non normative text just indicating that it's an option, but not, not requiring that, that the uh, prevention be done. We could uh, potentially drop, drop the tracking requirement altogether. Um, and I think we'd still keep JTI just to provide some, uh, Neil pointed out some nice improvements from just having additional interest P in the, in the proof itself that it's still probably good to have it in there, but we could just be silent on it and not say anything about um, suggesting requiring or otherwise having a survey track, track those for, for replay prevention. And of course, as always, the possibility we could do something else that I'm not even thinking of here. Um, another issue that's come up through some of this is that there's uh, maybe a desire or uh, concern that there's no signal that the refresh token is bound. Um, this came up, uh, I guess, in the IAW discussion, but I've heard it a few other places that it'd be useful to have uh, DPOP bound refresh tokens and bare access tokens sort of as a transitional step, but it seems like the spec requires the same token type for both access tokens and refresh tokens. Um, just wanted to note that the token type itself applies only to the access tokens. So from, from the original core spec, we are indicating with DPOP that the access token itself is DPOP bound. The refresh token, there's no, it, it can be bound or not bound, but there's no explicit signal and it's not in turn um, related to the token type itself. So that leads us to a situation where um, we have a document that prescribes binding refresh tokens, but only for public clients. Um, I, I think this is an area that needs to be clarified a little bit because uh, some questions have come up, but the idea is that refresh tokens themselves are bound to the client per the, the base specification of, of OAuth. And so in turn, if the client is a, 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 a confidential client with its own credentials, the refresh token is basically already sender constrained and bound to that client and its, uh, its associated credentials. But to add a little bit of, um, a little bit of improved security for public clients, Using DPOP, we can bind the refresh token to that client's public DPOP key. So I just want to, I will clarify and break that out a little bit better, but pointing out that this whole idea of binding or not binding refresh tokens is constrained to only public clients. Um, it's, uh, what was I trying to say here? It is certainly, I think, reasonable to expect that DPOP access tokens themselves could 
most likely be usable as bearer access tokens for resource servers that only support bearer access tokens. So um, the I guess the the scope of need, the potential need for unbound or unbound access tokens with bound refresh tokens is even maybe further limited here. Um, but it, it, having said all that, there are still cases where it's possible that a public client would be requesting access tokens, wanting to get bare access tokens, but still potentially uh, benefit from the value of having its refresh token bound. And the, the, really the question then is, does the client need some kind of explicit signal to say that, hey, this refresh token has in fact been, been bound to the, the uh, DPOP key that you provided? And certainly one option here um, is uh, token endpoint response parameters are extensible. It's an open-ended thing. So we could add a new parameter um, as a signal to the client that gives the client an indication that the refresh token that's been sent has been bound. Um, hopefully, I know I'm bad at naming, but hopefully the name here is understood to be a joke, but it could be something like this, just a Boolean value indicating it's a bound refresh token, or maybe even a, a more explicit signal like, uh, you know, sending back a hash of the key. So it would be like the DPOP, more or less the same value that you'd see in a confirmation, just indicating that, hey, this is the key to which, uh, confirming that I did did um, buy this refresh token. So that it's sort of, I guess it's, uh, we could either add something there or, or leave it as is, and it's sort of an implicit signal versus a, a more explicit one. I, I'm not sure what, what is necessarily better. Uh, another area of discussion that's come up is uh, a desire for client metadata. I mentioned earlier we, there's a number of uh, authorization, authorization server metadata fields indicating both the, um, actually I think it's just the, the, the supported algorithms, um, but people in general have said they're supportive of defining um, client registration metadata that might uh, somehow declare support for DPOP in the client. It, I'm really struggling to understand how this would be used in practice. Um, the client sort of can signal its ability to support DPOP through the presentation of the DPOP header when interacting with the authorization server. So I, I don't know what a client metadata value would be used for independent of that. Um, I felt like I needed to sort of give the issue it's due here, but short of um, someone being able to articulate a legitimate need or use, how it would be used. Um, I'd like to sort of put this one behind us. Brian, there's a question from George. George, by all means, I assume it's about hey, this 24 here. This one and, and a little bit the, the one before, um, but basically, I think somewhere in here, the other complication we have is OpenID Connect with dynamic client registration, right? Using asymmetric keys um, creates this interesting dilemma because you can use private secret JWT for your client authentication method, which is sort of like DPOP. So specifically to that client metadata perspective, the way that a DCR client may interact with the token endpoint as it relates to proving client authentication, maybe a private secret JWT, but are we saying that in addition, if they want DPOP, they have to send a DPOP, and if it is DPOP, do they use the same, you know, the same key pair set, or is it a different key pair set? So, you know, in in a single page app, right? That, well, even in a single page app, you potentially could attempt to do dynamic client registration. The you know ITP putting some issues on local storage right might make that not really viable. But other browsers, as it stands today, there isn't anything to say you couldn't use local storage in IndexedDB as as effectively your storage of the keys as they relate to doing an actual dynamic client registration in that in that browser, right? And so I think we have some interesting overlaps there that are a little bit unclear how we sort them out. Um, so I think that it does add some complexity. And in that 
particular scenario, right, having um, the client be able to say, you know, I want to do Depop, I want a Depop bound token because I'm going to use Depop for my access token validate, you know, for my access tokens to the resource servers, but I'm going to do client authentication because it's a confidential client with my DCR keys, right? And I want to use those same keys for, you know, Depop, or maybe we shouldn't allow them to use the same keys. But I, I do think there's some complexity here. Okay. So, I mean, one thing as, as currently written and, and also by design is that the client authentication is completely independent of the DPOP binding mechanism. So it, in a case where you had a, a client, however it was registered, but a client that was using uh, job private key authentication, that it remains unchanged. It would be the same regardless. And if it wanted to bind tokens, it would send in conjunction with that and independent of that, the DPOP proof header for binding the access tokens. Uh, we are currently silent on whether you could, should, or should not use the same key for that. Um, but, but it would be, at, it's sort of up at the client's discretion at this point. So. Uh, I mean, that's fine. It's an awful lot of weight, right? Because the DPOP header and the, you know, private secret JWT are going to be similar, though not the same. Um, if the, if the keys are being reused, yeah, they, yes, that's true. They are similar, although they are not the same. One is basically trying to show you, you know, authenticate by the use of uh, an asymmetric signature back to a key that was somehow previously registered. So you're saying, hey, you know, hey, I have this key. And you know that it's a key that uh, you should have for me, so that's my authentication. Where the DPOP header itself is basically just a self-contained unit saying, hey, I have this key, oh, and by the way, here is this key, and please do what you will to bind tokens to it. So um, I, I agree that in the case of, of the, that particular authentication type being used with DPOP, it's a little, I don't know, it's a little verbose. There's a little bit of redundancy there. But I personally, um, you know, prefer the commonality and not trying to special case or, or you know, build some, something else that would allow for a special case around that particular, particular way of doing things and rather just keep it consistent. Sure, that's fine. Um, I, and I think the other one that we may want to talk we can d defer to later really gets into the sort of like, um, you know, rollout strategies, right? And um, should we yes. really be telling resource servers to take a DPOP bound token and just treat it like a bearer one or whatever? So I'm happy to defer that to some other period of time, but that is another. That is actually, I think, either the next or the, some discussion of that's coming. So um, in, in this very slide deck, so it's a it's an important point I would like to discuss. Cool. Thanks. So we were, in fact, here it is. Um, a lot of words here up at the top. I don't know why I did that, but just trying to get a bigger picture understanding of what downgrades uh, and supporting of sort of tr transitional rollouts or even long term mixed token type type deployments. Where you might have resources that that require depop bound access tokens and other resources that are just going to be bare tokens forever being served off of the same authorization server we want to be in a place where we allow for that to happen and also allow for transitional rollout so it's not like a, a big bang on or off because that sort of thing rarely actually works but um allowing for it to roll out over time or even indefinitely support a mixed mode is uh, i think really important um, the main issue here is that there's basically not much in the document uh, discussing this at all right now, and that um, you know, lets people make their own assumptions about how it should or shouldn't work um, that oftentimes don't match other people's assumptions. So what I'm looking at, uh, suggesting, I guess, doing here is uh, make it clear that an RS, which is DPOP, 
enabled, so a, a DPOP enabled RS that wants to also support the bearer access token scheme at the same time. Um, so simultaneously supporting both does need to update its bearer token evaluation functionality and do so in a way that it will reject bearer tokens that are DPOP bound. So if it, it'll look at the token and find a confirmation scheme, if it's bearer and it finds the DPOP confirmation scheme, it needs to reject that. Um, but that would be you know, unique to changing functionality of the bearer token access for those servers that are also supporting DPOP resource servers. Um, a DPOP, uh, an RS that's only supporting DPOP is only gonna accept a DPOP token. So I think things are okay there as expected, maybe a little bit more wording around that. But then a, an RS that's only accepting bearer tokens will most likely accept a DPOP bound access token as a bearer token. Um, this may not always be the case, but in general, uh, JOT indicates that you should um, ignore claims which are unrecognized. The bearer token scheme itself is silent about any sort of binding and introspection. Isn't saved much one way or the other, but certainly um, is talks about the and makes allowances for additional information being present in the introspection response, which more or less just means that there could be other claims in the token, and here they are. So um, it's, it's not a guarantee, but I expect and would expect that the vast majority of bearer token only accepting resource services would in turn accept a bound access token as a bearer token. Um, and while this seems a little scary and maybe counterintuitive at first, I, I think it's actually a, a major plus because this helps support sort of mixed transitional type deployments. So a client could, without having to request more granular tokens based on specific knowledge of the resources, it can still continue to get sort of the token scope the same way that it normally would, just DPOP bound, and use those as appropriate at the particular, um, particular resources. And so it could get a, a bound access token and use it just as a regular bearer token on resource servers for which that's all they accept anyway. And um, as I fall over my words trying to explain this, I realize it's going to be hard to sort of write in a meaningful quality way in the document, but I think this is where we want to go to um, explicitly talk about how these kinds of things can be supported. And that really just boils down to mentioning Fine. this this fact about bearer and I Sorry, go ahead. I hate to interrupt you, but uh, we have a number of people in the queue. Very well. Um, I managed the queue, my friend. Philip? Um, Philip Skokan, all zero here. Um, I agree with your assessment that you know most resource servers will likely accept the depot bound AT as a bearer, but this highly depends on the client implementation and whether it actually uses the token type that it received as the authorization header scheme or it just you know uses better as a fixed value if it actually uses the token type as an input to its authorization scheme then this will most likely break yeah yes although i i expect it would break it would fail sort of closed so if the client is operating strictly off the token type it would send to a resource server this as a DPOP style. Um, the request would fail because it's a DPOP style authorization. There's no DPOP there. Exactly. And the resource server in turn would uh, challenge with a uh, 401 and uh, bearer authorization scheme request. I and absolutely so the agree. So from the perspective that there is going to be an unauthorized access, we're absolutely OK. It's just, it's not a seamless transition for those types of clients if they receive token type DPOP. But at the same time, if they do, they need to be sending the header. Huh. 
Yes, I think yes, I think I agree with you. Um, I'm seamless. If I said seamless, that was probably too far. Uh, it more seamless with respect to the resource server, I guess, being able to handle it, um, and the the client will. Yeah, I mean, I, the client's going to need to have some smarts or change its behavior some to make any of this work. So it, it seems. I guess I feel like it's okay, but if the are you um, the client it, the client needs to know that this uh, this authorization server doesn't support uh, sorry that this API doesn't support Depop and it's still going to use the Depop access token or the, the Depop bound AT, but it needs to use the better scheme yes. and this sort of transitions into the need for uh, client metadata or some sort of signaling mm -hmm. where. If I know I'm going to be using this access token at a resource server that doesn't support Depop, um, I either need to know and use the better scheme, or I want to use, uh, I want to tell the authorization server not to bind the access token. But, and if I'm a public client, maybe I just want to bind the resource token. So, yeah. I'm not sure how to. Okay. So, the, yes. Um. Well, while you think, uh, maybe, uh, do, do you want to hear the uh, George and, and Justin? They are also seems to be commenting on the yeah. same issue. I, I don't, uh, I don't, I don't want to stall the discussion, so I'll, I'll make my make my mind and, and speak up on the list with the with the well formed idea. You, you can you can say it here as well, but um, I think there are a few others who have some thoughts to share on this as well. Uh, Uh, George, do you want to add to that point? Uh, sure. I guess I worry a little bit about the client trying to know which resource server it should do what. I mean, I'd be more tempted to make the resource. I mean, yeah, the client know you know whether it should switch the authorization type from bearer to depop as it's going to different different things. I mean, the sort of hope of OAuth was that the client is rather you know dumb. And this is starting to add a significant amount of smarts into the client as it relates to delivering things. Is there a reason we couldn't just make the resource server accept both Depop and Bearer as, as inbound authorization types? And then, uh, you know, and you do that before you start your rollout. And then even if it doesn't actually support Depop, it'll just take that token and validate it. And then if it gets support for actually processing Depop headers or however it's going to manage that, right? Then it could add it in and add your other rule, right? That basically says if I'm supporting both, then, you know, I do the right thing with them. Um, but I just worry about making the client have to do this switch. Um. I'm I'm not sure. Yeah. I don't know exactly. The the That's okay. Um, I mean it, uh, Jim, if it's if it's a resource what, server, sorry. If, go ahead. I I'll I'll, I'll I'll concede. Um I was just gonna say if it's a resource server that you have no control over, right, and you're trying to roll this out, that's a different scenario than the um than the case of resource servers that you control um so you know we might need to consider both use cases from a recommendation perspective and i'll pass the ball to justin That's fair. okay so um yeah uh Bunch of stuff, but also I want to be aware that we have never let Brian finish a presentation. So, uh, how many more slides did you have? Not that many. So it's it, we might still make it. Okay. Uh, so bunch of bunch of little bits uh, to comment on, and I'm I'm happy to bring this to the list as well. Um, the uh, so first off about this downgrade thing, it's my 
stance that the client should never do a downgrade of the Depop token and that it would be up to the resource server to decide that it doesn't want to check the Depop proof for whatever reason or it can't and it's fine with that because that's not a decision that the client should really get to make and it puts the client in a really awkward position of being way too smart about security than uh than all of oauth ever expects the client to be and that's not a place we want to put the client or client developers um uh a quick uh call back to the jti issue uh a few slides ago um I think that the recommendation as currently written in 01 is good and that most of the concerns can be security uh, recommendations about properly bounding the time window for that. Um, yeah. Because the honestly, I think that the that the fears of, oh, I have to remember every number for all time forever. Are security. It's it's absurd fear mongering and we need to move past that. We can have good recommendations for reasonable people to build things because that's what people are going to do. Um, and uh, could you go back a slide or two, please? There was one other small bit. Oh, yeah, the client metadata and all the signaling stuff. Uh, I definitely agree that we're in a weird corner with both the client saying that it can do Depop and the uh, tying things uh, to the refresh token or not. Um, a lot of this comes down to just limitations in OAuths data model, uh, you know, Brian, as I know that you've said, we didn't really have a client data model until we had to invent one for dynamic registration. So we're kind of stuck with that as the place to hang things. And, um, and we don't have a good token response model that's separate from the single access token. So uh, I, I don't have a good answer for either of these, but I do think that we need answers for both of these. Um, and unfortunately, I don't think it's, I don't think that there's a clean way to do either of these uh, problems, uh, the bound refresh tokens or the client signaling its capabilities and intent. Um, I will say as a, uh, you know, coming back around to the first point again, um, a client that only knows how to deal with bearer tokens will never get a DPOP token in the first place. So that's not a use case we have to solve for. Um, and so going, you know, going back around, it's more what does the authorization server need to expect and enforce? So that's that's my stack of huge comments. Uh, thank you. I'm trying to internalize some of those, I think, or at least through my head, but I think I follow most of it. Okay, yeah, sorry for the fire hose. I will try to engage on these uh, points on the list and it, with the draft as uh, as it moves. Because um, I, think, I think a lot of these are going in the right direction. I'm really, really scared about the downgrade attack though. Counting on a client to do the smart thing in terms of security is guaranteed disaster. So, my thought there is counting on the client to do the right thing in terms of getting shit to work interoperability and counting on the resource server to do the right thing for its supported security model um right so yeah it is a little bit different the yeah um so that's why I was saying that the client that gets a Depop token should always, always, always send it as a Depop token. It should never send it as a bearer token without the proof. And it's up to the RS to decide how much it cares. But an RS is going to need to be able to look at the authorization Depop type field. And it can decide to ignore the Depop header if it wants to. Heck, we've got RSs that ignore signature validation and in, in issuers on JOT access tokens today because uh, they want to, um, you know. So the RS sh should make that call, the client should not. The client should always send a Depop token as a Depop token. The 
part of the thinking here, though, is trying to keep things working for RSs in a world where the RS is completely ignorant of the existence of DPOP tokens. Some some will be updated, some will be, you know, could could do what you suggest, but others will will not. And wanting those to continue working in a world where the authorization server and some clients are moving to be able to use DPOP all or some of the time, but a, but a resource server that's not being updated could still continue to work. That that I think is the more pressing goal versus updating resource services, resource servers to do DPOP, but ignore the DPOPing. Um, I, I think there's too much black magic and danger that lies down that road. Um, I, I get what you want to do. And I think if resource server is going to accept a new type of token, it needs to know about that, at least know where to look for that type of token. Yes, absolutely. Right, and if it can look for the token in that field and it's fine with doing just that, you know, it looks for the string depop instead of the string bearer, and everything else is fine. Then that is a minimal code update, but still an important update uh, because then you've, you know, you've at least identified that hey, here's an RS that is doing that needs to set new tokens. I agree that George's point about. Uh, RSs that you don't have control over is is an interesting one though. Okay. I yeah. Need to think about and discuss this some more because I think I disagree, but um we're we're running low on time here. So this will be an ongoing discussion. What are we doing on the queue? Um, yeah, now the queue is empty, but the time is also over. I got like a minute. Um, shoot, actually, that's a big one. Okay, we're done. <laughs> uh, I took some notes. I will send them to the list. And um, I've been trying, unfortunately, unsuccessfully to upload the presentation. I will try it again and we'll send the mail around once this is done, so we can uh, look at the rest of your slides, Brian. Okay, looks like there's... In any case... Yeah, there's just a couple, a couple more. Okay, uh, some more pictures. Um, in any case, uh, I would like to thank you uh, for the participation and then for the discussion. And we are going to send around the doodle poll to figure out what uh, other suitable conference call dates could be and when to start them. and. Um, Obviously, picking with uh, the overall IDF uh, strategy on on doing those, given that there are other, that other groups will have to also schedule meetings, so we may have some conflicts here. Anyway, uh, thank you all, and talk to you soon. Thanks, Hans. Thanks, everyone.